Seth, you may have turned me up a little bit. My voice is kind of exiting. <clears throat> so, I think most of us for the past uh, week or so have been gripped, uh, emotionally moved. Well, if you've been watching the news at all, of watching Israeli hostages being returned to their families or what's left of some of their families. Many of these families have spent the past 56 days earnestly hoping and praying that their loved one would be part of that next group that's coming back and being returned. Some of these families actually saw their loved ones being taken hostage uh, through video footage that Hamas released during one of those first couple of days. They had a glimpse of their loved one actually being taken hostage alive uh, by Hamas rebels. And they've hung on to that, that video sighting as a ray of hope over these past couple of weeks. They've hung on to that with great anticipation that they will soon, one day, be reunited with the ones they love. As I thought about that, I thought, in a similar way, the Advent season is somewhat about that. It's about a, a first glimpse sighting of someone who has promised to come, someone who loves us so much that he voluntarily came to this earth and decided to become one of us in order to be the once and, so all, once and for all sacrifice for all of our many sins against God. And it's about holding on to that glimpse of Jesus, that first coming of Jesus that's so described in the four Gospels. And it's keeping that glimpse at the forefront of our minds and hearts as we anxiously await and anticipate his return to this earth, his second coming to rule and reign over the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. The big difference in my illustration, however, is that Jesus is no hostage. He's not being waiting to be released by anybody. The moment he decides that he's going to return to this earth, there's no power in heaven, no power on earth that will keep him back. And on this Advent 2023, as we begin this series on the arrival of the eternal king, the main point I want to drive home with today is that this biblical Christmas story that we, we read every year, it's not necessarily a story of surprises, unexpected surprises. It really is a story of calculated fulfillment. And by this I mean, I don't mean that there's no surprises in the story. There certainly is. A virgin birth is a surprise. But what I mean is even these surprising and unusual elements have all been carefully spelled out in detail hundreds, even thousands of years before they ever came to fulfillment. And as we're going to see today, God had a very detailed, calculated plan in place, and his plan will always be accomplished exactly the way he said it would be accomplished. It's going to happen all in his perfect timing. And my hope is this morning, even as we think about that thought, that no matter where you're at in life today, what's going on in your life, what, how, where you think our country, our nation is, all the events that are going on, I hope that that thought that God has a plan and he's in control of everything and he's working everything toward his plan, I'm hoping that thought as Christians this morning will give us comfort, it will give us hope, it will give us a sense of peace that other people can't have during this month. So let's together take a look at one of the many prophecies they give us some specific details about the arrival of the eternal king. And before we look at the prophecy itself, I think it's important to tell you just a little bit about this prophet, Micah, and the context in which you're going to read this. This is all in the back of your bulletin on the outline. But here's a little context uh, of where this comes. Micah's a prophet, uh, speaks on God's behalf. He, he mainly uh, was speaking on God's behalf from about 730 B.C. to 690 B.C., right around the time of Hezekiah. And one of his tasks was to announce to both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, he had announced to both of these God's people that God's judgment was about to fall on them. Uh, he outlines this, if you read verses one through, chapters 1 through 3, chapter 6, he, out, he, he acts like a prosecuting attorney in bringing all the charges God has against his people. A lot of them have to do with idolatry and injustices. And he just he says, hey, there's a sure judgment that's coming upon God's people. Uh, maybe a way to sum it up is what he says in chapter 6, verse 13, where he says this, coming up on the screen. Therefore, this is he speaking on behalf of God, 
Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. The judgment that is coming through the Assyrians and through the Babylonians is irrevocable. It will be devastating. And this is the, the word that he has to give to God's people. How would you like to make that announcement to God's people? And just say, hey, this is sure unrevocable. Here it comes. But as you read through this, you, you see it probably this morning. Embedded in this, this message, this announcement of clear doom, there's a specific prophecy that would give some people, these people, a future hope. For Micah describes here in chapter 5, a ruler who's going to come out of Bethlehem, whose origins are from of old, we'll talk about that in a minute, and who will deliver them and eventually establish a messianic kingdom of some sorts. Look at verse 2 coming up on the screen again. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Number two in your outline says the prophecy, this is the prophecy right here that we're talking about. Verse two, the word of hope that one day a deliverer is going to come. And notice, I want you to notice three specific things from verse two about this deliverer who's going to come. Number one is the easiest one to notice. He's going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now, Ephrathah is just the old Jewish name for Bethlehem, so they're the same city. He says them in both names, so whoever identifies Bethlehem as Bethlehem, the older Jews knew it as Ephrathah. So here it is. It's a house of bread. That's literally what um, Bethlehem means. But here's this prophecy, and it's written about 700 to 750 years before the birth of Jesus, but it's very specific about where this future ruler, Jesus, was going to be born. It's the town of Bethlehem, a tiny, apparently insignificant town about four and a half miles north of Jerusalem. You would think, uh, if you're a Jewish person, you would think, hey, if there's a Messiah coming, he, he should be born in Jerusalem, right? Mount Zion. But no, it's this overlooked village. It's going to be the birth of the future king. What's even more amazing is that in biblical days, there was actually two Bethlehems. These maps aren't as big as I thought they were. I can see them. You may not. There's this one. But there's a Bethlehem in the north that maybe you can see. I'll go to the next map too. And then there's a Bethlehem in the south. Uh, the one in the north is just, just slightly north of Nazareth, three to five miles. And then the one in the south is quite a bit uh, nor uh, south of Nazareth. It's about uh, 80 to 90 miles depending on how you travel. But this specific prophecy that talks in Micah 5 2 says that Jesus is going to be born, this future ruler, in Bethlehem, specifically of Judea, the one way down in the south. Now, Jewish chief priests and scribes, they all believe this to be true, that this would be true. How do we know this? Well, we go to the uh, Christmas story in Matthew, and we'll find this out. Let me read it to you. Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who has been born, king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Uh, the reason Herod's disturbed, uh, he's very insecure, one of the most insecure rulers. He just heard there's another king coming that makes him very uncomfortable. So he calls together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He asks them, where is this Messiah going to be born? Listen to what they say. In Bethlehem. In Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet, who's the prophet? Micah wrote. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So this prophecy made 700 years before the birth of Jesus, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, not the other Bethlehem that would have been so much easier for Mary and Joseph to get to, it would have only been five or six miles, but he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. So how is a sovereign God going to work it out so this prophecy comes true? How is he going to work it out so that Mary and Joseph, how is he going to get them all the way uh, from way up north there down to south of this Bethlehem of Judea, 90 miles away, and how is he going to get them there just the right, at the right time? This is no problem for a sovereign God. He puts it in the mind of a Jewish leader, a, a, a Roman leader at that time, named Caesar Augustus. He puts it in his mind that he should take a census. And so 
Caesar Augustus says he's going to take this census, so everybody has to return to their town of birth. So Joseph and Mary have to travel 80 to 90 miles south to that, uh, that Bethlehem of Judea in order to register. They have to travel there at just the right time, just when Mary's ready to give birth, and that's exactly the way it happens because God said it was going to happen that way. So notice the second thing about this prophecy. It's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, the future ruler being born in Bethlehem, it says, look at verse 4, he's going to shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. What does that hint at? Well, if you were a Jew in those days, and you would have heard Micah predicting a ruler coming out of Bethlehem who would feed and shepherd and rule over his flock, you would immediately think of one person. Who might that person be? Somebody famous from the Old Testament. Take a guess. David, yes, yes, somebody got it right, good. Ken, I didn't have to call on you this week, wherever you went, Ken. He's not even there. So <laughs> I called him last Yes, David was born in the city of David, right? That's why it's called, in Bethlehem, that's why it's called the city of David. Uh, he was the greatest ruler in Israel, in their mind, and David was a shepherd boy. Any Jew in Jesus' day would have made this connection. Any Jew in Jesus' day made this connection. Matter of fact, look what they said in John. This is right after Jesus got done talking, coming up on the screen. Here's what they said in John 7, 42, the crowd around him. Hey, does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So in this, these passages, and in this passage here, the prophet Micah is reasserting the certainty of God's promise that he made to David. God made this promise to David hundreds of years even before this passage in Micah. It was back in the book of 2 Samuel. It was made through another prophet called Nathan. And listen what Nathan said to David um, on God's behalf. He said, I will raise up offspring after you, David, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his kingdom forever. You're going to read in your devotional book this week if you pick one up. This prophetic word from Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is right in the land. Micah here is confirming what the Old Testament says throughout, that the Messiah is going to come from the line of David, It's going to be born in the city of David, and he will, according to verse 4 here, he's going to stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And the amazing thing about this prophecy from Micah is that he reasserts this prophecy, the certainty of this promise, not at a time when Israel's rising to power. He's reasserting this promise at a time when Israel's about to be overtaken and ruled over. It's as if he says to Israel, hey, no matter what happens to you in the next couple hundred years, God is not going to revoke his promise about the Messiah coming from the line of David. Third thing about the prophecy from the verse, notice this. This coming ruler's origins are, quote, from of old, from ancient times. The mystery of the birth of Jesus is not merely that he was born of a virgin, which was another astounding prophecy that was fulfilled from Isaiah 7:14 but that this child born in Bethlehem was a child who existed, quote, from of old, from ancient days, which are Hebrew terms that speak of an eternal existence. Jesus is, as our series says, he's the eternal king. He was not created, he came. Matter of fact, just hours before his crucifixion, he has this conversation with Pilate, and Pilate asks him, hey, are you a king? And Jesus answers, and he says in John 18, yes, you say that I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Notice that Jesus says he was not only born, but that he came into the world. He existed before he was born in a manger. Jesus was the only person I know who lived before he was born. Unless you know somebody like that, let me know after. He's the only person who lived before he was born. He wasn't a, a person 
His birth wasn't a person coming uh, into a new person, but it was, a, it was an infinitely old person coming into being. It's like why Jesus could say in John chapter 8, right? He said before, he said to the religious leaders, before Abraham was, I am. According to Paul in Galatians 4.4, 4, listen to how Paul puts it. At just the right time, God sent his son to be born. Of a woman. That's why John tells us in John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. And according to Philippians 2, this preexistent eternal King who was in very nature God for no other reason than I can think of other than his love for each one of us in this room. He chose, for no other reason, to humble himself to become one of us and to become obedient to death, the Scripture said, even death on a cross. Therefore, friends, his birth, which was, as we established, foretold hundreds of years before it happened, thousands of years, it was purposeful. Think about it this way. Before Jesus was born... He thought about being born. Anybody else could say that? Did you think about your being born before you were born? <laughs> Come see me. I got a psychiatrist for you. Uh, okay? It's incredible to think that. But w- together with his father, here's the point. There was always a plan from the beginning. Remember in Genesis 3.15, ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden, what did, God had a plan from that day forward to crush Satan through the seed of the woman, right? So there was always a plan. So the prophecies contained here in Micah 5 about exactly where Jesus would be born, that he's going to come from the line of David, that he would come as the eternal king born of a virgin, are all part of that plan. And even the future prophecies contained in this passage, there's some things here that I think await a future fulfillment, like look at verse 3 where it talks about Israel, that even though all of Israel is going to be judged at this time in Micah's day for their rebellious ways, look what it says there. There's coming a day in verse 3 when the rest of the brothers of Israel will return. This is speaking of a day when Israel will be regathered. Perhaps it's what Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 11 when he says all Israel will be saved. And there's coming a future day, according to verse 4, when all of God's people are going to rest secure for his name is going to be great to the ends of the earth. Exactly when those events are going to be fulfilled, I don't know but they seem to be tied to the second advent of Jesus' coming. And just as surely as all the prophecies of Jesus' first coming were fulfilled, we can rest assured that all the events prophesied about Jesus' second coming will come to pass exactly as God's word said they would come to pass. Jesus will surely return. He will establish his earthly kingdom. We will dwell secure. His name shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be our peace. God's prophecies are as good as gold. If he spoke them, they will come true. He cannot lie. He's always had a plan. It will be fulfilled. But now in your outline, we come to the hardest part about God's prophecies, and that's number three, the waiting period. Just think about all the people who heard these prophecies, not only here in Micah, but throughout the Old Testament, about a coming Messiah and how long they would have to wait for them to be fulfilled. Between the time these prophecies were spoken, they were actually fulfilled, at least in the book of Micah, it's 700 years of waiting. And maybe what made it worse, they had no clue from the beginning what the specific timetable was going to be. They had no idea. And between the time these prophecies were spoken and they were actually fulfilled, just think of all they went through. They're about to be taken captive by Babylonians, and they're also going to live through a 400-year period, a silent period, a time between the Old Testament and the New Testament when God just simply spoke not to speak through any prophet. Micah gave them some good encouragement on this waiting period a few chapters later when he said in Micah 7, 7, coming up on the screen, he said, but as for me... I will watch in hope for the Lord. 
Well, as Micah said, don't lose hope. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Those were words the people needed to hear for the next 700 years. How hard it must have been to keep believing in these promises, to keep living lives, uh, you know, in anticipation of their fulfillment. Especially when you, you go through years of activ- captivity, you hear nothing new from God. And honestly, by the time the, old, the New Testament period opens... You, you are being ruled over, but not by a coming Messiah. You're being ruled over by Roman uh, oppressors. So waiting for the f- fulfillment of God's promises, whether they're individual to us or from his word, uh, they're all, that's always the hard part, especially when there's no exact timetable sometimes when God uh, promises certain things. But we can be assured of this. God always always uses these waiting periods in our lives, and if you're in one now, be assured of this. He always uses these waiting periods to refine us in some way, to teach us something about perseverance, about walking by faith, not by sight, and many times to prepare us to receive for what he's about to give us. So waiting while keep believing is the hard part. But then one day, and, and sometimes when you least expect it, especially if you've been praying over something for a long time, verse f- number four happens on your outline. The fulfillment of the promise happens. The prayer is answered. The, as the hymn writer put, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in the tonight. In one single night, history's changed. In one single night, the promises from Micah 5, all the prophecies we find in the rest of the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah, according to Matthew 1, according to Luke 2, in one single night in a cattle stall outside the insignificant city of Bethlehem, all the prophecies, every single one are fulfilled. Jesus, the preexistent Son of God, is sent into the world through a virgin girl, the eternal King. He arrives in fulfillment of all those Old Testament scriptures that they had to hang on to for so many years. The Word became flesh, and He became flesh for one purpose. The Bible says Jesus said it. He said He became flesh to seek and save the lost. So number five on your what lessons can we learn from the prophecies of the arrival of the eternal King? Well, probably the most obvious one is this. God always keeps his promises. Always keeps his promises. You're going to read this Thursday, hopefully in your uh, book here, about a man who had been waiting all his life to see the prophecies concerning a coming Messiah fulfilled. Read it to you here a little bit. What if you knew you had an appointment of sorts with the most powerful person in the universe, but it wasn't set on a calendar? What if you were told that you would have an audience with the king of kings, but given no date or time, told only that it would be some time before you die? Luke 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the coming Messiah, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, we're not told a lot of the details here. Like whether Simeon ever told anybody else about this word he got from the Holy Spirit. Uh, My guess is that's such good news, he he had to let it slip out to a few people, right? Hey, just let you know, the Holy Spirit told me I'm not going to die before I see the Messiah. Uh, How long did he have to wait? We don't know. How many thousands of babies had he already seen and looked over and wondered? We don't know. What were other people saying about him? Well, I can imagine there were some. If this went on for a long period of time, they are probably saying, well, there's that silly old uh, Simeon man. He comes here every day. He thinks he's not going to die until he sees the Messiah. That's what he tells us every day, and he's still sitting here. But then one day, one day it happened. Luke records that Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to dedicate him. Simeon looks at the child, and he knows instantly this is the Christ child. He knows that God has kept his promise. He takes him in his arms. He holds him up. He says, now that I've held him in my arms, my life can come to an end. 
I've seen your salvation. He's the light of the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Imagine waking up every day wondering, will it be today? No doubt the promise revealed by the Holy Spirit was memorable and compelling, but surely there were moments when Simeon felt the weight of waiting for the one and only, the singular source of salvation for all of humanity. How did he persevere through the agitation that comes with knowing the end of the story, but having to live with the uncertainty of the in-between? I can only conclude that Simeon's devotion was rooted in the person with the plan more than the plan itself. What a gift it is this season to see the arrival of God's salvation through Simeon's eyes. I want to wait well, as he did, full of assurance that the king will return just as he promised. Do you believe God always keeps his promises? Are you living in such a way that your life would, and your decisions would indicate you believe that? in your financial world, in your relationship world, in your time, the use of your time, do you, do you really believe God always keeps his promises? And if you're in a season of waiting this morning, as some of you might be, are you continuing to cling to the promises of God, choosing to walk by faith, not by sight? God always keeps his promises. And what we've learned from this story is this, for sure, his means, his methods, his timing could be a little unpredictable. But he's going to keep his promises. This is what David said in Psalm 143 right there. The Lord is faithful to not some, to all his promises and loving toward all he's made. Second lesson we should draw from, from God being faithful to the promises concerning his first coming the logical conclusion we should we want to ask ourselves, are we living in anticipation of the return of the eternal king? Do we believe he's going to keep his promises about that, about the return of the king? God's promise that his son would return. If you go back to the very first week when we went through Acts, all fall here, the very first week, God made that promise clearly to the early church because they're all standing there, they're watching Jesus, woo, go up into the clouds, and there's this angel, and he speaks to all the people watching it, and what does he say? Look, the same way you saw Jesus come up through the clouds, guess what? He's going to come back through the clouds in like manner. That was a promise given to the early church from day one. Someone did some calculating and found, and not me, but found that every prophecy in the Bible concerning Christ's first advent, for every one of those, there are eight that refer to his second advent. So one for every eight. I said, as I said earlier, even some of the things we're reading from Micah 5 here this morning more likely refer to the season of Christ's second advent. Are we living in great anticipation? an expectation of the return of the eternal king. Jesus' main message for us concerning his return can be summed up in these two words, keep watch. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark 13. Read it to you, coming up on the screen. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Would you read verse 37 with me? What I say to you, I say to everyone, keep watch. Well, keep, I'm going to put keep in there too. Keep watch. There are two extremes that we can go to about this, about Jesus' return. There's always two extremes we want to avoid. Uh, one would be this, over-focusing, becoming uh, uh, you know, consumed and obsessed with exact prophecy and prediction details. And there's some people really into that. Um, I think there's a caution there. Listen, the main purpose of all the predictions, all the prophecies, 
in the Scripture in my mind isn't necessarily to provide an exact and precise timetable. If God wanted an exact, precise time, I think he would have been more clear on a lot of things, especially in Revelation. But, to de- but the prophecies are there to demonstrate this, that if God says he will do something, you can be sure he will absolutely do it. And our hope for the future is primarily based on the absolute assurance of what God will do, not necessarily when it will happen. Now, the other extreme we want to avoid is being apathetic and cynical about Jesus' second coming. And this we can easily fall into because if you've been raised in the church, you've heard all your life, hey, Jesus could come back any day. And Peter describes what he refers to in 2 Peter chapter 3 as people, he refers to them as scoffers who are going to start saying things in the last days like this. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has at the beginning of creation. Peter wants to address those people, and he says, but look, don't forget, a day is like a thousand years. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promises, but he holds back and hope that more will be saved. And then he he ends at verse 10 by saying, but look, I want to reiterate, the day of the Lord's going to come like a thief. And he says, how should you live then? You should live holy, godly lives. You should make every effort to be found blameless and spotless. Don't be living as a scoffer or a doubter. Don't be falling in love with this present world. The return of Christ is always presented in Scripture as a great motivator to godly action. That's why John says this in 1 John 2, 20. He says, Uh, When Jesus, the eternal king, appears, make sure you're found in such a way that you can be confident and unashamed at his coming. That's 1 John 2.28, confident and unashamed. Like Jesus' first coming, his second coming will not be a story of surprises, at least for believers. We're reading about it. We can read about it all the time. It's going to be a story of fulfillment. And the way it won't be a surprise for any of us as believers is to wake up every day and say, this could be the day. I won't be surprised. This could be today. Are we living in anticipation of Jesus' return? And what I want to ask you to think about in closing is, as we reflect, uh, you know, this belief, this firm belief in Jesus' return, how does that affect how we celebrate this month? Because Advent's not just about celebrating the the coming of Christ, the first coming. It's supposed to be mixed in with thinking about the sure second coming of Christ. So what what I'm wondering about is what ways would our confident belief in the second coming of Jesus, how would that shape our conversations through the rest of the month? How would our confident belief in the second coming of Jesus actually affect Um, how we spend money this month or our gift giving this month? How would that affect that? How would our confident belief in the second coming of Jesus actually affect what we do with our time this month? I've narrowed that all down maybe in this homework question. If you want to write this down and work on it for homework. Are there ways in which our confident belief in Jesus' second coming should affect how we celebrate his first coming? I don't have all the answers to that. I've been thinking about it. I'm thinking for sure there should be, right? There should be ways in which our confident belief in Jesus' second coming should somehow affect how we celebrate his first coming. We don't expect this, this relationship to happen for people who don't know the Lord, for the pagan world, but for those who know Christ and are sure of his second coming and know of his first coming, How should that affect how we go through this month? So stretch yourself, maybe stretch your family a little bit as you think about that and see where God leads you on that. Would you stand together? I want to close in prayer here. I want to encourage you, too, to pick up one of these books, if you can, and go through with us. just bow for prayer and and just one other thing as you pray over one of the things you might ask yourself as we pray here that 
how did these Jewish leaders miss all these prophecies about a coming Messiah, and they, and they missed it? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the, the basic reason is they heard a king was coming, and they wanted to rule over the people. They didn't want somebody else ruling over them. But I want to encourage those of you who are here this morning. You've heard these prophecies now. You know how God had an exact plan. Don't you miss it. Don't you miss receiving the Savior. Don't sing songs about the Savior all month if you don't really know him. This is your opportunity to come to him as well. So don't harden your hearts against the Lord. Don't miss this. Humble yourself. Ask Jesus to come in and rule over you. That's what he came to do. And when he rules over us, things go well. Father, we thank you that you have come into this world and you had a plan from day one how this was all going to happen. Thank you that you've revealed that plan through your word and that you've opened up our minds and our hearts that we can understand it and we can receive it. I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has not yet bowed their knee to you and and asked you to rule over them, that they would do that even today so that this month uh, they could look in anticipation of your second coming. Lord, we know that if we haven't done this, bowed our knee before you, we should live in fear of your coming. Continue to work in our hearts, Lord, in understanding how our belief, our firm belief and conviction in your sure return that you've also said so much about in your word, how that should affect and inform our daily lives, especially during this month when we're celebrating the advent of your first coming. Show us how we can be distinctive in this celebration, how we can stand out, that we can be a witness to a Uh, people at our workplaces, our, our relatives, our neighbors. Lord, use us, we pray, to point people to you, the eternal king who has come to save us and redeem us and who will one day come and return us all and establish a new heaven and new earth. We look forward to that, Lord. We thank you. Send us forth now into this world to be your representatives, to be your light and salt wherever you may send us. We ask this all in the name of Jesus who loved us, came to this earth, gave himself for us. And all God's people said, amen.